Hi, everyone, and welcome to this fantastic episode of the P3 podcast. I am ridiculously excited about our guest today, and over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to explain why. Um, not only has he played at the highest level regarding football, he's played at international, he's played at the English Premier League, he's also played across many countries, so he brings a vast of experience to the podcast today, where we're going to talk about everything around human performance, coaching, and mindset. Um, but the big fact around this young man is that he is the only player to have scored a hat-trick in the English Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two, the FA Cup, the League Cup, and at international level, as well as the FA Cup, I believe. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Earnshaw, how are you, Ernie? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Very good. Very good. It's a nice introduction. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that, that, that uh, record you got there is still standing, and that's going to take some beating, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. It's still, do you know what? I get that's the one thing I get reminded of so much everywhere I go, and it doesn't matter where I am in the world either. You know, mm. people always bring it up, but it's kind of nice. After like after a while, I was like, yeah, I think that's me. <laughs> so, but um, but it's nice because it's it's something unique. You know, I think the best thing is when you can when you can leave the game with something unique, something of an achievement. So. Uh, no, I do. I ap- appreciate it. I appreciate it way more now than at the time. Actually, funny enough, I was actually getting interviewed on Sky um, at Charlton away. I was playing for West Brom and, uh, and uh, I actually didn't know that I achieved that. And uh, I think it was Chris Kamara, actually. It was, uh, and he's like, you know, now you're the only one who's, who's scored a hat-trick at this, 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 this. And he's, he reeled them all off. And I was like, oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know. But... Yeah, but uh, it's funny. That's how I that's how I found out. But I appreciate it yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's an amazing achievement, mate, and, and and thoroughly deserved as well. Always a always a natural finisher, a natural goal scorer. That's for sure. But but what people don't see behind is the graft that goes into that and the sheer hard work and the practice. So, and, and the people are probably picking up on my language there. I think we've got a little bit of a confession to make. Um, we just chatted in the prep there, you know, before we come online. That it's 24 years we've actually known each other, which is scary yeah. because I still feel about 18. How about you? He's same, <laughs> the same. <laughs> One, it's it's funny. Like we said, it, it keeps you young. The game keeps you young, and I think um, you know just the how the game is, the change rooms, the people. The, you know, the people you meet, everything. You um, you you're always that that kid playing football. I think there's always that inside of you. So it's uh, yeah, he's just he's, you always feel young. So that's good though. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, for sure. And before we come on to, you know, how we met uh, towards the back end of our teens, can you, um, can you shed a little bit of light for people that don't know maybe on your background? Because obviously you're known as a Welsh international footballer, um, but you weren't born and brought up in Wales, were you? No, no, I was actually, um, so background is, I was born in Zambia in um, really a, a tiny I call it a bush. I was, uh, you know, I was, I was born in the middle of nowhere, uh, a place called Mufulira in Zambia, um, which is in Africa. And um, my, my dad was English um, from Yorkshire. Um, my mum, Zambian. So my dad was working over there. He was a coal mine uh, manager. So he was head of like, you know, working on mines and things like this. So he was working over there, met my mum. Uh, obviously I had kids myself and I was born over there so I was born in Zambia um, I lived there till I was nine so first nine years was you know I was I was in Africa so that's where um, that's where I kind of have come from um, and then my dad passed away when I was nine and uh, that's when we actually moved to to Wales so um, a lot of obviously my background has always kind of been through football and growing up in Wales, but um, I was actually born in Zambia, grew up, you know, I remember a lot of it. And, um, and it's something that's, uh, it's still, obviously, that's where I'm, that's where I'm from, you know, even though, so I've always kind of been torn, uh, split between Africa and, and Wales, because, you know, one is where I grew up, um, you know, the, you know, I'm from, yeah, I grew up in Wales, but I was born in, uh, in Zambia, you know, in between that, I also, I mean, we used to move around as well, because my dad, used to be, uh, you know, manager of a coal mine. So we used to move around a little bit. We lived in Malawi for a few years as well, which is something that's uh, close to my heart as well. And um, I remember fondly. Um, 
yeah so yeah so that's that, that's kind of my early early life but um yeah uh, my mum also was uh you know was a footballer as well uh, back in zambia so that's something that uh, is kind of a little bit different and i don't know whether i get the skills from her but uh <laughs> i guess it was an influence you know i guess it was an influence but um yeah um and also i, I got other family members that were actually uh, did quite well you know uh, my my second cousin is kalusha walia who's uh at one time he was african player of the year he um he we, we, you know we i mean i obviously knew of him really when i grew up a little bit because i was i was still a kid um and he went on to play for psv eindhoven he played for club america in mexico he played for the zambian national team he was uh you, you know was the best player african football of the year so um you know i think he uh he went on to have a great career as well so i i i, I did have a background in in football even though it, was, it wasn't directly influenced you know so you'd think oh, oh you know that's the background but it was that's it wasn't directly influenced because it was very kind of sparse uh, you know like very far apart you know kalusha was in mexico and holland and belgium um you know my mum uh, already finished playing football by the time i even was thinking about becoming a footballer so uh, a little bit different but um but that's a lot of the background and then obviously when i was nine we moved to uh, to uk we uh, my dad passed away uh, my mum wanted to be closer to her, her older sister. Her older sister was living in Wales. Um, so we moved. Um, and also for education, kids, I've got uh, three sisters and a brother. Um, so for all the kids and, and the, uh, the British education as well. So we, my mum wanted to, to raise us in, in, a, in a place that um, we could get education. We could live a, a better life, a good life. So um she's also close to her, her sister as well so we moved to wales and that's how i ended up in wales and um and then after that really is is then obviously we started growing up then so but that's the that's the background from from where my early life was can i ask you just a further question then so obviously mm. you touched on a few things there obviously your father <clears throat> passing away um what what was the upbringing like in Zambia? Was it because I've got I've got mixed pictures in my mind, you know, in terms of that stereotypical image of Africa, you know, sort of underprivileged, yeah. difficult, but also your father being a mine manager, being fairly affluent for the local area. What what was the upbringing like? It was, you know, it was very it was mixed because um, I guess I wasn't really the typical kind of you know you see the pictures on TV or the videos or what you see of the, the poorer side of Africa, uh, which it was back then. I think it's, it's not so much now because, you know, the, the, all the countries now, are, um, you know, they develop every year. So, but um, there was the side of it where my dad was, you know, obviously, you know, a little bit better off than the locals. Uh, he's, you know, going into little villages, little little towns, little areas where there's the coal mine. So it's, it's always in the middle of nowhere, you know, cause that's where the coal mines were. And we used to live there. We used to live really a good life, really. You know, we had nice house, um, uh, compared to, you know, everybody else. But, um, but then there's the other side of it where all my friends or we went to like school and things like this, or, um, was people that were, really the locals where the, you know maybe they didn't have anything they didn't have money or they lived in the little you know literally little little huts and things like this so we used to go there and play and we're on the streets and you know we it, we would walk around whatever play play whatever games and things like this so there was the side of it but we, i think when you're like you know five six seven whatever you don't really you know you don't really think about those things you know it is it was just normal you know oh we go play with our friends we, we play and that's it you know and it's not like oh this is this and this is that or this is you know more money or that you don't really care you just like oh this is my friend go play so that's the that's really like how it was but so there was there was the two sides of it so uh but it was good you know i had a really great upbringing very diverse upbringing you know, um, because, you know, first of all, living in Zambia, um, living in, um, you know, and, and 
all my mum's side of the family was from this village, Mufalira, and, you know, the surrounding areas. And then um, that's kind of like really, you know, there's parts of it where there's, there's nothing, you know, and there's, there's very little. And there's parts of it where there's, you know, nice houses and, you know, people and everything like that. So, um, and then there's the other side of it where, we, you know, we grew up and, you know, things were, were nice and got exposed for different things and traveled and, you know, got to really see a lot of, a lot of things before even really I was nine, you know, just things like even languages, you know, I was in Zambia, they've got, you know, their own language there. So I learned it. My dad was English, so I, I knew English. Uh, we moved to Malawi. They had a, a, a main language there. There was, there was another language. So kind of learned that. So by the time I was nine, I was kind of like really speaking like three, four, five different languages. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's like, that was normal, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, um, it's, it's a crazy, really, it's a crazy background, really a crazy start to life. But it's as a kid you just you take it as it as it is you know um and that's how it was yeah i think so and i think a lot of it resonates because <clears throat> you do it's just, just normal that's what happens doesn't it it's not until you get older do you look back and reflect and went well that was normal that was slightly different because I, I don't know if i read somewhere um and, and obviously don't never believe everything you read online but did you have to fly to school at some point during your childhood as well yeah so um yeah so we when we moved to malawi um, so I lived there for about, I think it was about three years, three, four years. And, um, we, we used to go to boarding school because one of the best schools and where my dad wanted us to go. Um, so it was me and my, uh, me and my older sister, uh, my, my, uh, my younger sister, I've got a younger sister, then there's me, uh, and then two older sisters, then, then a brother. So it was me and my next older sister went to uh, boarding school um at the time and uh it was like uh, you know a few hours away and um so boarding school we we used to go on the weekends uh we used to come back home um and then on a monday uh, or a sunday night we 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 came, we went on a plane and uh, and flew there and flew to to school and then went to school and then for the week and then a lot of the time, then we used to come back then and fly back on, on the Friday and, um, and then stay the weekend and, you know, see the parents and then, and then fly back. So there was a, there was a lot of times we did that. So that was the reason that we, because it was the distance and everything. And, um, I, I don't even know why, how, how actually <laughs> we, we ended up like flying, but yes, you know, there was a lot of times where we flew to, flew to school. Yeah. Well, I think there's a message there in terms of your parents just finding a way to make it work, isn't it? You know, and if it's yeah. flying you down to, to work or go to school Monday to Friday, then you find, and, and my brain's gone all over the place here. I've got to be honest with you, Andy, in terms of, you know, it's quite a diverse upbringing, is not it? You know, in terms of moving, yeah. in terms of the challenges of your father passing away, moving from Africa to Wales, um, you know, the, the boarding school there, playing with your friends. Um, you've got obviously relatives that have been successful. Your mum's a footballer. Looking back now, with the success you've had to date and what you're going to go on to do in the future, um, do you think that upbringing to that point has played a massive part in building your character to be able to go on and do what you did? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I um, totally believe that 100%. I think, um, I think everything, or for me, I, I, this is what I believe anyway, um, I think everything that you go through, exposed to, and um, influenced by, uh, all leads you to the direction that you go later on in life, um, you know, and, and the things that you go on to achieve or, or go and do, whether it's work-wise, professional, you know, personal life even. And um, I agree, it's the same. Uh, everything that I was exposed to when I was young and, and the influences and how I was brought up led me really to, to become uh, to be, you know, to play football, you know, and, um, you know, not just play football, but also things that go around at the outside of the football, you know, the personal life, the, the living in different places and things like this all leads you into a certain direction. And it definitely led me into the direction and, um, you know, maybe not realized it till I was later on, but, but really like it, you know, whether I was always going to try to be a footballer or want to, um, I think a big part of that was moving to the UK because football was so big and it was such a, 
Um, football's huge in Zambia and it's, it's the biggest sport and, it, and everything has a huge following. But then when it got to the UK, then it was, it was very different, a different way of looking at it, you know, uh, and looking at it on TV, you know, I mean, because in Africa, you know, before I was nine, it is very little TV, you know, even things like that. So we didn't watch cartoons when I was growing up. We didn't, we didn't watch TV apart from, you know, there was a certain amount of like videos <laughs> because of my dad. There was videos that we used to, we used to watch and, and we watch those and we, if we had five videos. That's the five videos that we watched. You know, in, in the UK, there was like channels and we watched TV and live football. And, you know, I got exposed to that. So when I got exposed to that, then it was like, I don't know, it almost like fed that, oh, that's what I want to do, you know? And, and that's, that's, that's what I see in my future. So everything before that was really opening everything up to be able to, to I guess, really, you, I think you, you get to a point where you find your thing find your direction, find what, it, what grabs you. And I think when I got to the UK is when it was like, really like, Oh, that's what I want to do. You know? So I think everything before that really leads you and, and leads the path and, and opens up things to, to whether you're going to be able to go to that or not. If that makes sense, I hope. <laughs> so when you come to the UK, then look into the setup when you're looking at, you know, were you aware of the setup of football clubs, you know, in terms of academies? Or was you just, well, I'm going to Wales, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to play for a local team, and um, whatever happened will happen. Was it on your radar, I suppose, is my question. I think it was only on my radar, because I didn't really start playing until I was about 12. So, um, and then that was like, because I saw my friends playing in, in the street. You know, I wanted to play football. I enjoyed playing football. So before that, I played a little bit of football. Like in Zambia, I remember, you know, we used to, we used to play a little bit of football. But um, it was like, you know, just we just playing for fun. You know, not till I got to the UK where I was like, oh, you know, I want to play football. You know, I want, and I see, you know, even like in Zambia, we couldn't go out and buy footballs. We we made our own footballs, you know, and we made them through like, you know, plastic bags and string and things like this. And we kicked that around them. I remember that in school and things like this. So when we got to the UK, then it was like, you know, people, you see like a kids playing with a proper football in the street and things like this. So I wanted to go out and play and started playing a little bit with my friends in, in the street. And then one of them asked me to, uh, to come and play for their, for their team because he saw I was, I was um, pretty good. So he said, oh, you should come and play with, with our team. And I, th I think I remember I was about 12, 11, 12 at this time. And then that's when really like, um, you know, went down, did some trials and, you know, played for the local team um, in, in, uh, in near Caerphilly, where I'm from. That, that's, and, funny, uh, that's funny, mate. And I'm really going to say it's because obviously Rob Earnshaw, the things I've talked about, you're having trials for your local team. <laughs> As in yeah. not, not your local club, your local sort of village team going down for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How did yeah, that, yeah, how, yeah. How did that go? It was, it was good. It was good. Well, I, I mean, it was trials, and then um, I got into the B team, so I didn't quite make the A team. <laughs> so I got into the B team, and uh, I played for them for a, for a season. A team called Lambradic, uh, Lambradic B team. So I played for them, scored some goals, and then um, and then that's what that was my profession first, uh, not professional first uh, first team I played ever played for. Um, and it was one of my friends because it invited me down to the trials and I got in and, and started playing. And then that's the first team I, I played for. And, uh, and it was great. And it, that's, you know, I think from there, that it just sparked everything. It sparked me wanting to do more of it, wanting to go that direction, wanting to play. Uh, and then obviously the more and more I saw, you know, teams playing on TV and things like this. And then that's, that was really, that grabbed me. And I, I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. You know, I want to pursue this, but it wasn't, it was never like, Oh, this is, you know, this is how I'm going to do it. It was never like a known direction of this is how I'm going to do it. It was just, that's what I would like to do. And it wasn't really, you know, a little bit of luck as well that, you know, as I got a little bit older and played for different teams and, you know, they spoke with different people and then, um, you know, luckily that um, I got to end up at, uh, at Cardiff, you know, with the, with the youth team and having trials down there. So there was uh, very much an um, unknown path. That's the best way to, to, uh, to put it.
Yeah, so you've gone through gra grassroots. You've, you've probably, from the age of 12, I think, were you 15, 16 coming to Cardiff, I think, when I first met you? Yeah, I was about, uh, I was 16 when I first joined, but it was about 15 when I first got spotted. Um, and um, that's when I first started coming down to, like, training. Because uh, I, I remember it was right at the end, right at the end of, like, the, I think, um, picking the youth team. Yeah. Um, and then that's when I first started coming down to, to training down with Cardiff. Yeah. So this is where we can add a little bit of context because I'd been at Cardiff as a youth team player from 12. So I'd been there four years. So I was fairly established. Okay. So I would, I'd been part of that core team, you know, where you're playing a year up, so, or a couple of years up. And then I think I remember the first time you come training. And I don't know if you remember, I, was, it, was it on Indian Park the first time you come to train? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was on uh, Indian Park, yeah. We played half a side, sideline to sideline. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I remember it vividly. And I reckon you had yellow Quasar boots. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, the reason I remember it, right, and this is another funny story, is um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm famously quite conservative. I'm quite reserved, right? And so I was always a black-blue player, always, all day long. Yeah. And that summer, for some reason, I really fancied these new blue Asics, right? These new blue Asics had come out. And I really fancied okay. them, but I didn't have the guts to buy them. Um, and, I, and I was like, no, I'm going for it, I'm going for it. I went and bought them. So I was really nervous going to the first day of training that summer. Because um, <laughs> I was waiting for the youth team coaches or the first team manager to go, who do you think he is? Yeah. So I sort of walked out with these blue boots on. They looked at me and then behind me, you walked with the yellow boots on as a trialist. <laughs> so they all just looked at you. So I just went... I just looked behind him and everybody's like, who's this trialist think he is? Who's this scrawny little kid that's going to come kicking the ball about? <laughs> so it was perfect because you deflected everything away from me. Um, and it's a, and a funny you're welcome. I, yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. Um, do you know, do you know that it's funny because I, I only got those like a few months before and the reason I got them was uh, they were, do you know what, they were, uh, they were a, um, a brand called, I think it's Kronos or something with a K. And um, the reason I got them was Risto Stoichkov, uh, played for Barcelona. He's one of my favorite players. And uh, he had them on. And then uh, I, don't, I can't even remember because this is like, you know, obviously now you can get yellow boots and orange, any color boots that you want now. But this is a time where there's no yellow boots anywhere. There's, there's everything is black boots. That's it. You know, they don't even make them. And for some reason, this, this brand, Kronos, uh, made these yellow boots. And um, this is 90, probably 96, 1996. Yeah, it was, yeah. And, um, and there was, I, I found them somewhere. I can't remember uh, where I found them. And, um, and, I, and I bought them simply because Risto Stoichkov, I saw him wear them. And, uh, and that's, how I, that's how I got them. And I, I didn't know any different. I was like, I love these boots. I wear them. I play football. I, I like them. Then that's it. <laughs> that was the attitude. So yeah. it's funny, especially looking them back now, because the other day a, a, a picture came up of those same yellow boots and I was playing for my local team here. It must have been under 15s. And uh, it was probably the year before that. And um, I had those boots on. I was like reminiscing. Just how, uh, how I love them so much. Yeah. Bright yellow boots. The only one with bright yellow boots. <laughs> yeah, and it was a full... When you come in, and it was fantastic because, as you definitely appreciate now, you probably didn't on that first day. We never got to play on the first team pitch, never. You know, and because it was mm. a pre-season pre uh, sort of trial game, it was almost like a, a possibles versus the probables. Um, yeah, yeah. And we played, it seemed like four or five hours. The score was like 148, 132 or something. You know, we just played yeah, for yeah. hours on end. And it makes sense now that they were obviously <laughs> making decisions of who was going to get the full-term youth team contracts, weren't they? And I think that was probably that day, if it wasn't before that, that's the day where they made that decision of thumbs up for you, I think, where, you know, yeah. you know it would have been June, July, you know, start pre-season next week. And then the rest is history. They say, hey, yeah, yeah. So, uh, actually, a, a bit of a crazy story. Um, so, leading up to that, so um, I think I, I think we it's probably about two or three times though we we came down. I think maybe two or three times. Yeah. And um, I remember. So, uh, the thing about that was that was the end of the school year, and it was I remember it was just before the GCSEs, 
Um, and um, so the backstory to that is a few months before, uh, literally maybe a month or something like that before, um, my local team, GE Wales uh, from Kafili, we were sponsored by GE General Electrics. So that's why we were called GE Wales, but we were Kafili, uh, a local team. And we used to play on there where now they, they have their factories uh, literally five minutes from, from, uh, from Kafili. So we used to play there and then they built a, a big giant building so we couldn't play on, their, on what their, their football pitch was. So we got moved down to Traforest where the youth team, Cardiff youth team was playing and used to play. Yeah. So um, the, we got moved down to there. We started playing in like the Cardiff League, the Ponty League. So we played down there and we ended up playing on the same day as the, the, uh, the Cardiff youth team, Cardiff City youth team. And, um, and we happened to be playing on the next pitch. Gavin Tate, who's the, who's the manager, uh, they were kicking off maybe 45 minutes later than us. So he comes over to watch our game and um, we're on the next pitch. So he's looking at the game or whatever. I'm playing. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know who he was. And um, I score a hat-trick in that, in that half. And um, he apparently liked me. So he, he um, went and spoke to our coach um, and, uh, and asked about me. And then we carried on the game. I ended up scoring four or five goals or something like this. They, they're playing their game on the other side. And then um, my manager came up to me and said, oh, the Cardiff coach was watching um, you know, that game and he was impressed and he wants, he wants to speak to you. Um, and he wants you to come down and do a trial, you know, training session trial. Um, so this was like a month before. So Gavin Tate saw me. And then um, afterwards, spoke with him briefly, invited me down to come training with, with Cardiff. And then um, leading up to that, then those were the training sessions that we just talked about just now. And then trained. Uh, and then when they were making the decision, I remember it was the, it was the night of my uh, school record of achievement night. So it was the night where they, you know, it's like the end of your year, you know, the final year, you're just about to go into the GCSE. There's only exams and we still have a record of achievement night. And it was, you know, the biggest night of the, your whole school years. And um, it, was, it happened to be the same night as one of the training or the last training session that Gavin Tate was, was putting on. And um, it was at, obviously at Cardiff City's like Ninian Park. And, but my school was in Ponte Breathe, which is like what? It would take me 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes to get from to my school to Ninian Park. But it was uh, it was almost this, almost the same time. So what we what what happened on that night is um, my mum's boyfriend at the time. He was like, like what what are you gonna do? You know, they're on the same night. Like you, obviously, you have to go to your school record of achievement night. You know, they give you the papers, the certificates, things like this. Um, and I was like, yeah, but I, I want to train. I, you know, I'm, I got invited to Cardiff. You know, I, I, that's what I want to do. So I had to pick, but in the end, I was like, if I had to pick, I, I would rather go to the football. But, you know, obviously my family was like, oh, no, well, no, the record of achievement night and everything like that. So my mom's boyfriend at the time was like, listen, let's do both. So we, um, so he's like, listen, I'll drive you to both. So at the time he drove me, um, we trained. Um, I did well that day training and everything and Gavin Tate was picking like one of the one of his last like uh, you know selections or whatever for the youth team and um, I remember him after training because I was thinking oh we've got to go to record achievement night it just finished training and I you know just kind of like a little bit you know just naive almost and um, he calls me into the office and he goes um, uh, listen I've, I've got some good news you know we we want you to uh, to come into our youth team you're you're the last pick and um you know this is this is a, a an opportunity for you and uh so i was like yes <laughs> this, this is amazing and then in the back of my mind i was like we gotta go to the record with you and I. <laughs> so uh so like he's obviously explained what it was what's what direction what's gonna happen you know opportunity to go you know into the youth team and obviously you know, really become uh, the first steps to become a professional footballer. So I was so, so happy. And um, 
as as soon as he said like you know that's it or whatever obviously we said yes uh that was great and then straight away we flew straight out of that room went straight to uh pont de Prix, drove as fast as possible <laughs> uh because the record of achievement i was on um and then drove up to to pont de Prix. i literally pulled up there was a big hill going up to my school pulled up we pulled up jumped out of the car sprinted into uh into like the hall uh opened the door my class was literally just walking past the door going up to the uh to the stage i walked into the line joined the line went up onto the stage took my picture got my certificates thank you very much smiled we we went sat down and i sat down like this and i was like oh my god what an evening <laughs> i remember one of my friends was like what's up what's wrong he's like I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. What a story. But yeah, but it was literally, it was literally that. So I, I was very lucky because I got, just happened to be Gavin Tate, you know, you know, on the sideline watching, inviting me down, you know, the record of achievement and how it, how it all happened. And then uh, managed to do both, both uh, big things, I guess, uh, at the time. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so and I, I've got I've got a few visions flying from my head. I've got one of you going within the speed limit, of course, heading back up towards Pont de Prix. I've got <laughs> visions of you stood on a stage sweating in your football kit with the, the red leather binder, binder the um, <laughs> record of achievement, remember them? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, but I think the key message, I think a lot, of, a lot of people that might be listening to this are either youngsters tapping into academies or looking to tap into, or parents of kids that... You just never know, do you? You never know when you're yeah. playing, who's watching, who's looking. And that's not just a grassroots level if you're trying to get into an academy. That's later on, you know, which we'll get onto in a bit with your pro career is you never know what coach, what executive, you know, is in, in the audience or in the crowd watching and they've got plans and ideas of where they want to go. You just never know, do you? No, you have no clue, no idea. And I, like I said, I was, you know, I didn't even know really it was like a trial. So because... It, he said, training, come down to training. Let's, you know, play your best, do your best. And, and uh, you know, let's have a look at you. So that's what I did. I literally went down and I was training. And then it's not really until, like, he's, like, called me into the office to say, hey, like, we've been looking at you. You know, this is why we've been, you know, trying to analyze and trying to pick, you know, the last, you know, one or two spots for the youth team. And this is why you've been asked to come down. And then you're one of them. And that's when it was like really like hit home, and I was like, "Wow, like oh, like that's amazing," you know. Because at the time I was just trying my best playing football, and I thought it was amazing, you know, just to be there. And um, yeah, and that's you know, it's you really don't know. You you don't know who's looking, who's watching, who's you know. So that's why it's it's so so important that you just you know you always you know try to be at your best. You try to focus and. Um, you know, every minute is every minute counts. <laughs> it really does, and you know, it's the same. It was the same for me. That's how that's how I became uh, a footballer. You know, it's it's how I got spotted. It's how everything kind of you know happened, but also carried on happening because as you go on later on and you 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 play here, you play there, things you know happen in a similar way. What's what's incredible for me, and and now linking it to what I experienced from that point onwards, from you know, your coach saying, you know, and Gavin saying, right, we've got, did he give you a two or one year YTS as well? It was a two year. Yeah, it's a full two year. That, yeah. that, from that, that moment, your career didn't stop because the next 12 months, that was a whirlwind. You went from, so basically going for a training session, not realising you're on trial to, you know, starting pre-season at a pro club that you hadn't been to before, which was yeah. a, a huge adjust in itself, adjustment in itself to, kicking on through the youth team reserves. I think it was the back end of that season you played for the first team, didn't you? Straight away. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was within, um, I think it was around April, maybe beginning of May, that those training sessions, just to, you know, to those trial training sessions with the youth team, uh, that happened to, I think it was around November, December time, that I made my debut for the first team. Yeah, so what's that, six months from Caffili League to play in league football? <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. That same year, I went from, you know, I did, the funny thing is, going into record achievement, I remember one of my friends in school asking me, and uh, he says, oh, you know, what are you going to do next year? And this is before I went to training with Cardiff. Um, and he said, oh, what are you going to do, you know, like, next year? And I, I remember saying, I, I don't know. 
I don't know. I I think probably I'll stay on in sixth form, you know, and and uh, I want to do something in sport, maybe study something in sport, but you know, but I don't know. I haven't got a clue. And then it was maybe the next couple of weeks, um, I go and get a YTS uh, contract with the youth team at Cardiff, and then a couple of weeks later, I'm like turning back up and be like, oh yeah, I, I, I'm going to try to become a footballer, <laughs> you know? So all within like uh, a couple of weeks or something. So it, it was literally how it, how it happened. And then obviously, you know, six, seven months later, um, I'm playing for the first team, you know? <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it was a crazy, crazy year, literally a whirlwind because it all happened very, very fast. Oh, very fast. So what's your memories of being um, the old school YTS footballer, you know, turning up and cleaning boots and <laughs> changing rooms and all that? Do you, do you have sort of fond memories or vivid memories of that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Fond memories and some bad memories. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was, no, it was good. It was, it was the, it was the, I always see it as the, one of the most important parts of my career because it was the beginning of, setting the the core setting the um really like the direction of of where i was going to go and how i was going to do it and 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 also the learning i think is the biggest thing because you know you turn up and you know you're expected to do jobs you know and clean this clean the changing room and i remember i was cleaning the first team changing room uh before that you know we were on um uh, I was doing the balls. You had to pump the balls up before training. Uh, that was my job. And then after that, Ian, you have to clean three uh, first team players' boots. Um, and uh, and then you go and you've got like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or so. And then you, you're in the changing room and then you, you go out and train then, you know. But after you've started off your jobs in the morning, after you've been in like, you know, the little physio, uh, the little uh, weights room that we used to have, which is like... Uh, a tiny little office with so many equipments all over it. But, um, and then afterwards we still, we used to have to do the jobs, clean the changing room, you know, obviously clean all the boots again, make sure everything is tidy, sweep up, you know, clean our changing room, make sure everybody's done the job. So that was the, that was the youth team setup, And that's what we used to have to do every day. And it's just, I, th I guess it teaches you a lot of things at the time. You don't know because you're like, Oh, this is awful. I have to clean this and I have to do this. And, you know, anything that you'd expect the 15, 16, 16 year old kids to be moaning about. And it was the same. But at the same time, I also understood that, oh, this is what we have to do. And there was no question of that. There was no like, oh, but why do we have to, you know, it was like, oh, this is painful. I don't like doing this, but this is what we have to do. So I guess it taught me a lot of things of, you know, taking care of your stuff, taking care of your own boots and, you know, cleaning this, cleaning that. Because, you know, now especially, guess what? You're have to clean your own house and you have to clean your own stuff and look after things and take care of this. And, and in your career, you end up, you take care of your, your career and decisions and things, you know, things that uh, are bigger than those little things when you're a youth team, but it sets the kind of the path and, and the, the learning of, of what it takes. And that's, but that was normal because every, every club was doing that. Every club was every YTS player, you know, youth team players, they were all doing that because it was a, it was a way of teaching them fundamental skills that um, not necessarily for the pitch, but more of just almost the life skills, I think. So, yeah, yeah there was big bits around ownership and responsibility, wasn't it? Because you, I remember like there was a little bit of pressure on us because when the first team used to go and play away, they'd go maybe a couple of days before sometimes and we'd have to pack their boots, wouldn't we? So not, yeah. just, not just one pair, maybe three or four pairs, because you didn't know what the weather was going to be doing and then for the conditions they were playing on. And God, yeah. for, God forbid you forgot to pack your players' boots. <laughs> you can yeah. imagine, can't you? Remember, yeah, we, yeah. we had that big chest of boots that uh, remember, uh, Jimmy, the physio, yeah. used to have to pack and drag everywhere. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and but we about, also have to make sure that all the, all the first-team players' boots, and you had to pack them because you, you're the one who cleans them. Yeah, and if, yeah. you for, if they're not in there, it's you. It's your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in somewhere in there, we used to train and play games ourselves, eh, as well as all yes. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, good times though. Good, good, good memories because it was it was fun. You know, at the same time, it was it was fun because there was always a joke around the corner. There was always something happening, or you know, somebody's winding so and so up in the other room, and you know, you're do busy doing your job, but there's a there's a practical joke going on. So you know, between two or three people or something like that, but. 
like you know those are good those are good things that you remember as well yeah absolutely a good bunch as well didn't we but then you quickly accelerated you know in terms of that ability to learn you know ability to seize opportunities as well there's a lot of principles i think within what happened the next 12 to 18 months you, not only did you get into the first team, but then you started spending more time training with them, didn't you? Sort of getting brought yeah. in, playing more games. The next preseason, I think you fully went pro, didn't you? Was it just within one season of Whitehurst yeah. you went pro straight away? Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, yeah. As, as soon as I hit, um, as soon as I hit seventeen, they gave me a pro contract. Yeah, yeah. so it was within within one year. Within yeah. one year, I went from literally not knowing what I was going to do to uh, youth team to reserve team to first team. To then the season after, the, I remember at the beginning of the season, they were like, okay, w- uh, which dressing room do you want to be in? So I was like, well, of course, the first team. <laughs> uh, so I, I went into there and I was, I was uh, all the time then with the, with the first team. Yeah. So, pe- people listen would understand that because there was a big divide, wasn't it? The youth team would be in the away change room. And yeah. The first team were in the home, obviously, and you wouldn't go in. No way. Like, you'd have to be invited in unless you were yes. taking a tray of tea in or something. Um, <laughs> So that was a massive step, literally a step beyond the void, wasn't it? You know, over the void, yeah. just into the gap. And that was a big thing. But um, I know certainly the lads that were left behind with me and the youth team were so chuffed for you, you know, in terms of, and I wanted to see you kick on and you definitely did. How did you physically and mentally find that step from, you know, Caffili League, youth team football, granted you had a bit of exposure the year before, but now I'm fully in with these grown men playing football. It was an adjustment. It was a big, big, big adjustment um, because really you're a kid and, at that time, we had an older, very experienced um, uh, group of players uh, playing in the first team. You know, it wasn't like, you know, you've got 10, you know, 18 to 24-year-olds. No, it was like two or three. And then there's me who was like 16, 17 with the first team. And then you've got like 30-year-olds, 31-year-olds, grown men, you know, three, four kids married, like lived in five, six, ten different places. You know, some of them already played in the Premier League, um, things like that. So it was like a really older, so it was older experienced team. So it was very, very much. And also the crazy thing is I was still tra- cleaning their boots. <laughs> so, and rightly know? so, and rightly so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they, they, they kept you like, okay, this is, this is where you are. Uh, you're still learning. You, you're with us, but you're still learning. You know, so they kept you very grounded. Um, but at the same time, it was adjustment because it was like, Every day was like something brand new, something completely, you know, never seen before, brand new or learning off the field, on the field, you know, going to the, going to training, coming back from training. So it's always something and you're exposed to, you know, 20, you know, 20 different pros in different parts of their career. So it was a, it was an adjustment because also at the same time, you're 16, 17 and you're naive and you, you, you haven't seen some of the things it's brand new to you. So, um, you know, what I try to do and I think I've always tried to have is, is, you know, I see, I learn, I try and understand what's happening, you know, sometimes ask questions, but, you know, you, you try and learn as much as you can by looking around and um, especially, you know, when you get feedback from, from all the players who've kind of been there and done that, um, I think it, uh, it, it helps, you know, and there was a few that really helped me as well, you know, tried to help me. And saw that, uh, you know, I was a kid, you know, kind of trying to make my way, trying to become a footballer and try to be where they were. So there's a few that helped me as well. But, um, you know, at the same time, there was a few that uh, taught me a lot of things, you know, some, sometimes not the easy way, the hard way. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, a lot of, a lot of things. So it was, a, it was an adjustment. It was an adjustment, but good, you know, good, good learnings, you know, good, good teachings, good things. Uh, I, a lot of life lessons, you know. Yeah. But um, I remember who was the goalkeeper? Was it John? John. John Hallworth. Yeah. Hallworth. Yeah. John. I remember in a training session, we, me, me, and you trying to chip him. Do you remember what he used to do if if we tried to chip him and didn't score? Do you yeah. Remember? Yeah. He yeah. Would yeah. Boot it about three miles the opposite direction. You'd yeah. Grab it. the ball and then smack it and say, "Go get it." Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah, you yeah. dare. You know how old are you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Don't you dare try, try to chip a, Try to chip a, a chip an experienced player like me. You know, go get your ball. Yeah, <laughs> and you, yeah. you smashed it over the fence or whatever. Wherever it landed, you had to go get it. And it was, yeah, uh, yeah it's funny. Because, and he used to do that every day. 
But that was about earning your status as well, wasn't it? You know, in terms of could you then still have the confidence to go and try and do it again? Knowing yes, that you're yeah, going to yeah. absolutely rip to shreds by this ex-Premier League goalkeeper. <laughs> but yeah, but that's, that's how hard it is though, isn't it? Psychologically, yeah. you're getting challenged by, you know, as, as a 16, 17, 18-year-old pro like you were, you're getting challenged yeah. by a 34-year-old experienced man who's been there, done it. I think he played in like FA Cup finals and that. Um, yeah, yeah. And you've got to adjust to that quickly and build that self-resilience to go again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you you have to you have to. I think you you're very you get on with it, but you're also not the strongest mentally, you know. And uh, I think you start to you have to build that, and it takes time to build that. And every day was something that built that, you know. Whether it's you know they were you know messing around and and saying. You're not very good, <laughs> you know, as direct as that, and or that this is not very good. Or you have to do better, or you didn't, you you were crap, <laughs> you know, um, or they, you know, you grab the ball and say go get it because you try, you know, you try to disrespect an older player, you know, so go get your ball, you know, whatever it was. So it's always like a, a build of like, you know, I guess mental toughness, and that's how they kind of sort. And that's that was just the culture. That's just how it was, and um, you learn off. So many different things like that, yeah, all the time. Every day, there's there's something, you know. Well, that ties in. We definitely didn't know it at the time, but you know, a lot of the the studies and science right now is saying that, you know, mental resilience and mental strength it, it can only be built through experience, you know, and it's having that ability to be able to reflect on that experience of what it was for and then come through it and learn, you know, and learn yeah. moving forwards. And I think that again is another principle that from afar you demonstrated as your career kicked on and I know you had some different challenges we'll talk about but looking at that first stint at Cardiff City you know that that first season if I remember he's a pro again 16 17 I think you got promoted if I remember rightly um, yeah. in your first season um, you then become a cult hero scoring regular goals you know the somersault uh, celebration which you took throughout your whole career have you still got on the locker by the way uh, I believe I have. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a little while. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to say there's a little bit of hesitation in there. So any of, any of your fans listening who are at your club, let's just say you've still got it. Yeah, one of your previous clubs, you've still got it's, it. It's been, a, it's been a little while, but I believe I still have it exactly the same as 20 years ago. <laughs> I got visions of you playing football in the garden and still doing it, you know, celebrating <laughs> the goal. Um, so your, your first few years at Cardiff, clubs, you went back again at the end of your career. Um, how, how fondly do you think of that time at Cardiff City? Um, oh, it's amazing, amazing. Um, I think when you when you look back now, when I look back, I think um, I can really appreciate even the, all the little things. But I appreciate even um, you know even the the people you're exposed to and the different personalities and different people. Whether it's like you know in our youth team, you had fifteen different personalities, different people. You know, you go to the first team, you know, different people around different. You know, the coach, the manager, the you know the physio, like all everybody was a character in their in their own way. So you're 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 dealing with a lot of different people all the time. But um, you know, I I remember, I mean, listen, great times. You know, great times. I think um, some of the most enjoyable things that happened at that around that time, around the you know when I got into the first team and and um, you know playing regularly because I remember as youth team players we used to sit up on a on a Saturday, watch the first team and everybody was, oh, I wish I was down there playing. And, you know, I got the chance to play that, uh, to be there and, and go and play and uh, become a regular there. And then I was then on the pitch, you know, thinking like, this is, this is, I was up there. Now I'm, I'm here, I'm playing. And, you know, and then really, I was, I was really fearless really in, in, in how I approach things. So the next step was always, okay, right. This is it. And this is okay. How do I, figure this out uh which which is the direction for this okay let's let's go so it was always that so we got into the first team scoring goals and it was always I, I always had in in the in in really in the forefront not the back of my mind more the forefront of that's where I want to be I want to be in the first team I want to be scoring goals I want to become regular I want to have the number 10 shirt I want to you know be scoring 20 goals a season and and that's all my direction led me to. So anytime there was a challenge, there was this. Um, and then when you achieve something and when you get past something, when you, when you almost tick something off and be like, yeah, now I'm playing and now I'm, 
got the number 10 shirt and now I'm scoring goals all the time. Now, you know, I'm playing in the first team regularly. It, it was always like a, a big achievement. So I always think about that time as uh, amazing. You know, I loved it. I loved it so much and um, it was enjoyable, but it was also enjoyable because you're achieving things that you've always wanted, you know? Yeah, and there's loads of things from a, you know, a personal development perspective there around you had some clear goals, clear defined goals, and a, obviously a clear natural drive to, to get after them. But I also think you know, the language you were using there, you, you, you seem to be naturally inquisitive in terms of what else could I be doing? What's good? What's bad? What's indifferent? How can I make that better? How can I fine tune it? And you know, there's a lot of literature now around this growth mindset, you know, always learning. You know, even from yeah. bad situations, I can learn from it. Now, that wasn't something we talked about in 1996, 97. But it mm -hmm. seems to be something that was ingrained in you fairly young and probably set you up for success for the career you had. Is that a fair assumption there? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And I think I didn't really put my finger on it or point it out or, or whatever until really years later. I think it was just, it's there, but it's not said out loud. Um, and I think... Uh, that was that I was always inquisitive of like okay how's that done or how do how do I do that or, or you know like look at the process you know because it was always about the process with my with my mentality and it's like okay how did he do that and you know how amazing was that but I, I didn't see like the last action I see okay he did this and he did that and then he did that and then it ended up being this that's amazing you know so it's always that process of of the steps to the end result. So when I was, you know, obviously coming through and you, you're trying to achieve something and you're trying to get better, it was always the same process of, I want to become this, or I want to do that. So how, how, how do I kind of do it? You know, obviously there's the practice, but the practice needs a direction that it needs. But, and a lot of that was driven by yourself. So naturally your own drive is your biggest, um, uh, teaching is your biggest training because you have to start to figure out how it works. How, how do you do this? How do you do that? Uh, what, what are you doing wrong here? How can you adjust it to then improve it? So there was always that. So I was, I've always been very inquisitive because more just very curious, very curious to how things work, how things can be done better. What's the next steps? How do you get to higher places? So that's just a natural curiosity, I think. Yeah, we talk, talk, you know, in my, my day job now, what I do when I'm working with athletes and, and businesses, we talk around process versus outcome focus. You know, which one are you mm -hmm. spending your time looking at? So the outcome could be the result. So in this, for instance, the outcome is I want to be a pro footballer. Yeah. But you don't sit on your backside all day just praying that you're going to be a pro footballer one day. It's about, well, what am I going to do today? to make yeah. that step more likely to happen and bring that closer because you can get to the end of the day and go, well, I've sat my back settled. I've done nothing. So I've wasted a day. And you, you, it doesn't seem that you ever did that. You were always either mentally stimulating yourself by studying. Was that true? You know, like watching games yeah. and, and then physically, oh, yeah. whilst I'm physically resting. Cause I all, as I'm chatting, now, I'm getting flashbacks. You were a bit of a stato, if I remember right, in terms of players, goals and stuff. And you, were, yeah. you were very much a student of the game, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to watch, uh, I watched everything. I watched everything. I mean, you know, back then you couldn't really like just, you know, watch everything, you know, you watch English football, but I never really just only watched the English football and the Premier League and, and you know, Cardiff and things like this. I used to actually study everything. So I remember uh, you could watch like the Italian football that was on on Sundays. Um, then on Mondays, there was this program that showed like um, European football but it showed the highlights and goals and things like this. And, and then um, you could then like, if you, you know, random times at night, you could see like little um, clips of like different other football. And there was a, um, there was a football program on, um, on Sky Sports at the time. I used to watch every week. I used to record every week and it showed football all, from all around the world stories yeah, individual interviews and players and, and things like this. So I used to just soak it up. And I remember, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you know, like you're a great finisher and is natural and everything like this. But at the same time, I'm like, not really. It, you know, it took work. It took work of like studying. And I, I, I realized later on that it's all the things and accumulation of all the things that I watched over and over again. I used to watch goals over and over again. 
and see the process and the mindset, how the, the timing, and, you know, um, and I used to watch games over and over again to the point where I, I knew them, like I could close my eyes and, and, you know, who made the pass and how he moved and where he went, you know, so I used to do a lot of, lot of studying, but not to, uh, you know, just to, to know it. It was more of like, I, I wanted to know it inside out. I wanted, I, I loved watching it, you know? So when I watched it over again, it was like the first time I watched it, you know? And the second time and third time, it was, it was exactly the same feeling. So I used to watch the games over and over again. I used to watch full games, you know? I used to, I remember recording games when they were on. I would record them, keep them on tape, and I, I watched them, you know, a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later. So all the time, it was, it was a constant just study, just only because I loved football. And I wanted to watch it over and over again. Yeah, so so I think the bit you're talking about, you know, you just immersed yourself in sort of studying it. And I think, you know, within coaching, we talk about visualizing what you want to do, you know. But sometimes mm -hmm. people, even though they try and visualize it, they can't see it, if that makes sense. They try and visualize it, but they can't see it. Now, for yeah. example, we all remember, certainly the football fans out there, you know, Van Basten's famous volley from a tight yeah. angle, European Championships, I remember rightly. But yeah. if you watch that and watch the movement of his feet, his body position, his eye on the ball, you know, the yeah. technique he used, that wasn't obviously luck. That was himself studying, watching, learning, and, and trying it. You have to know that it's possible for you to be able to try it and make it possible for yourself. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, so you're, you're pre-priming yourself for success. So then when you go and practice and try it, then you could just got to tweak what you did to make it different. Is that, is that, yeah. is that what you're getting at? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, Van Basten goal, uh, 88 um, European championships. Yeah. That was a classic goal because that's one of the goals that inspired me. I, I watched that a million times, you know, the angle of the ball, the cross, where he moves, the angle, everything. I, I, I watched a million times and studied it, but it, it was always that it was, First of all, you have to. The worst thing you can do is have a um, um, I don't know, <laughs> you know, or I can't see it. You know, you have to be open, first of all. Um, and I was always completely open to the fact if, if something I see something, there's nothing that told myself because the first thing is your own doubt. You've got, you've got to erase the doubt completely. And I, I, I guess I was blessed with with anything that I put my mind to, I, I see the path and that's it. Oh, I want to achieve that. I'm going to achieve that. I don't know how, but that's where I'm going. You know, so now I start to figure out how, but I have to say to myself, yes, that's what I'm going to do. So that's going to happen, except I don't know the path. So a lot of people just look at the path and think, oh, but it's going to be this and it's going to be hard and, and then you have to do this and you have to do... So they start to look at those things rather than, okay, this is going to happen. So with everything that, you know, whether it was something on the pitch or whatever, uh, especially when I, there's certain movements and things like this, I already, I already try to see it before and be open to it. And then it's, okay, if I move here, this is what's going to happen. And he moves here and this... And then if, I, if, if he delivers the ball here, then I'm ready for this. This is what I want to try and do. If it doesn't happen, you know, so that's the, always the, 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 the space of time in between before it happens. And then, and then obviously, you know, the, the, the practice every day or whatever and the training, you can try these things. You can practice, oh, you know, the timing is a little bit off or this. The, you know, things can be a little bit off, but you, you have to allow yourself to believe it, fully, fully believe it. And I was lucky enough to always believe everything that I was going to try and do. I believed I could do it. It was just, I haven't practiced enough. I haven't spent enough hours trying to do it. Or sometimes you just, naturally, you, you can sometimes just be able to be like, yeah, I can do that. And you do it. Or just because, you know, sometimes you don't need 10,000 hours of training. Some certain little things you can already achieve by saying yeah i can't I, I can't i can't do it you know um but a lot of the time obviously most most things come from practice and training and and being able to you know do it a few times and then it gets better and better to to um to a high level yeah and i think you know what, what you were talking about there is really really powerful and i think it's that 
that bit around telling yourself you can. And I think mm-hmm. when you're so used to telling yourself you can't, that I can't to that I can is too far apart. You know, it's like, mm. I'm, I'm, it's a habit, isn't it? It's, it's habitual. Yeah. You know? I know I can yeah. do that. I, I firmly believe, and it's not, in a, it's not in an arrogant way. It's in a way I firmly believe I can do that. And if I can't do it yet, I'll work out a way of how I can do it. And yeah. it's, you know, when you're trying to achieve that goal, I use the, the metaphor sometimes. It's like human Pac-Man that I know I want to go to the other side, but I might go up one avenue and I might have to come back and go down another one and start, you know, there'll be blockers in yeah. the way as there always is in life. But that blocker isn't going to stop me from getting where I want to be. I just got, I'm going to, have to, I'm going to have to reinvent myself or I'm going to have to tweak something or change. Um, yeah. But that's what ties into that growth mindset is a, you've got to find a solution in that moment. And it might be something you haven't done before, but it's that power of yet. And a lot of the coaching we do now, I'll be honest with you, is, is about that, you know, in terms of adding, adding a really powerful word into your dictionary of, I can't do that yet. Because what that yeah. does, it creates, it creates the sort of the position of opportunity and potential. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I, I totally agree. And uh, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, definitely for me, because, you know, it was always from from when I saw, I remember watching the 1994 World Cup. And, I, um, and just before that, I was watching uh, Barcelona. I was watching Romario. Like I said earlier, I was, I was always exposed to different football. So I studied it. Um, I, I remember Romario was one of my favorite players, Brazilian player. Uh, went on to win the World Cup in 1994, but before it, I used to watch him for Barcelona, you know, I, um, and um, it was always like, uh, you know, uh, being inspired. And then when you're inspired, it fills you with your own then, um, I guess, direction or what it triggers for you. And then what it triggered for me is like, I watched it. I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. That's where I want to be. I want to score goals. I want to do this. I want to, you know, and then, you know, going into that, then you, it, it, you have to be completely open to doing it because as soon as you make excuses and, and it's, you know, as soon as you even have the doubts and listen, it's not all 100% you can do it. It's sometimes 90%. You know, because there's, there's sometimes a doubt of, you know, can I, can I not, but I'm going to do it anyway, you know, and, and I'm going to try anyway. And the trying is where it lies, you know, and the, it, as soon as you, you firmly, you, you believe it as much as you can, but also try, that's where you can then go on and achieve because it's easy then to say, yeah, or oh, it's maybe too hard. I, I probably won't try it you know, or you don't end up just naturally trying it anyway, you know, and that's where, you know, it's not definitely not going to happen. There's, there's one definite result that it's not going to happen if you don't try, you know, so yeah, I was always that- curious, but Im- imagination and also just the, the drive to be like, I for sh- that's what I want 1 million percent. That's where I want to go. I need to then start to figure out how I'm going to get there and what's going to happen. Um, and even if I don't know, that's the, how that's going to work out, how that's going to happen. Even if I fail, it, that, I fail, I fail, but I'm going to try to win. I try to do it, try to achieve it. So that's always the, always the, the driving force. Yeah. And I think there's, there's another bit in there around people connect in the, uh, I can't, I can't is actually driven by the fear of failure. Uh, and mm-hmm. that can be in any walk of life, you know, whether you're going to go for a job interview or, oh, well, you know, I want to apply for that job because like, it's just, just apply for it and let somebody else make the decision. You never know. You might get an interview, you know, and then you go and do your best and try and enjoy it. And then these are the things that I live by. Anyway, try your best, try and enjoy it. That's all you can do and learn from it. You know, there's, yeah. there's nothing else you can do. For, otherwise, you're going to prevent yourself from being as happy as you want to be in life because that's all we can be, isn't it? Is everyone's version of happiness is different. Just try yeah. and achieve your level of happiness, you know, and um, yeah. that, that, that fear of failure is things that hold so many people back these days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's difficult because some, some people cannot help it because sometimes it's, it's already within them or whatever. But um, the best thing is you can make small steps to change that. Um, I was lucky enough that from young, I wasn't, I wasn't given like um, uh, tons of boundaries, you know. I knew what was, I knew what was right, what was wrong, what I should and what I should not do, you know, and naturally, I think as a kid, you, kids have that. And you, when you're a young, when you're a young kid, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, whatever, you kind of know that, 
It's whether you then say, oh, I don't care anyway, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, that's when it's like, yeah, you're going to do bad stuff or you could do good stuff. I always knew and I always knew I, I grew up on doing the best thing, doing the right things, doing good stuff. And what I wanted to do was do good stuff. And that good stuff was I want to achieve something. I want to make something that's bigger than myself uh, that I can, I can do, that I enjoy. That's the, my passion. Um, and, um, and once you start to kind of like have no boundaries of what you can go and achieve and the direction that you want to go, then it's really, it's like, yeah, okay. There might be one or two people or five people out of a hundred that can get picked, but I'm going to be the one, uh, or the number five or whatever it is, you know? Um, but it's always the case of really not having no boundaries of, I'm going to be one of those. I just need to put myself in the right place, right way, right manner, right thing, um, right direction of what I, uh, how I'm, that's going to happen. And, um, and I always kind of felt that way. It feels like, Oh, that's one in a hundred. I always felt like, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm going to be that one in a hundred, <laughs> you know, it, or you can't do this. Well, I, I believe I can. So I'm sorry about what you believe. You know, I believe I can. So that's what I'm going to try and do. I, I'm, you know, it's, and it was, uh, you know, when you talk about earlier about things like um, going into the first team, going into a first team environment and you're a kid, you're 16, 17 year old. That was my whole mindset. Um, um, does I want to become a footballer. I'm going to try and achieve this. And uh, listen, I was always faced with, oh, but, you know, he's, you're too small and, uh, you know, you're skinny and, you know, you, you're going to get bullied around and, you know, this is a, a, a sport of men, you know, and things like this. So it's always that. Uh, but it was always my mentality was, well, I'm sorry you believe that, but I, this, I'm sorry, I've got a different idea, mm -hmm. you know. Um, this is what I want to try and do. So when, when you're bullying me around and throwing me around and I can't fight with you with weight yet, I'm working on that. Yeah. You know, when, when, when we get on the pitch and there's 11 v 11, well, I'm, I, I've got certain skills that I know of. And that's why, you know, even I played a striker and I always knew the, the, the biggest thing that can take away any, any restrictions, any boundaries, any, um, any like, uh, I guess what you call them negatives or whatever on the pitch was the, the, the end result on the pitch. Every, everybody's on the pitch to try and score a goal and win the game. So I set myself the target of I'm going to do the hardest thing on the pitch at the very best that I can possibly be and make the, the, the difference. So, okay, you might bully me around uh, two or three times, but guess what? I just scored a goal and it's 1-0 and I scored the winner. So yeah. which one's more important? <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. Or yes. Yeah, so they're you're winning, bigger than me. They're winning you know? little battles, but you're going to win the war because I'll do the most important thing when it, when it happens. And I think yeah. that there's a big bit here. So when we talk about coaching, we talk about you know, the physical side of it, strength and conditioning, et cetera, which definitely you went on a journey, didn't you? Because you're mm. naturally quite slight, actually, aren't you? But, yeah. but the benefit of that is quick off a mark, very, very quick anyway as a sprinter. But I think some of the things that people don't see unless they've played at that level is it doesn't matter how quick you are, you need to be able to make quick decisions with your brain. You need to process mm. information and make the decisions really, really quickly. Because that's, yeah. that's the decision, I, that's, that's the thing I see is that when I'm coaching elite athletes and Olympic athletes now, there's not a lot between them really, apart from mm. decision making is a big part of that. Yeah, I, th I think that's what you're alluding to, really. You know, Ernie, in yeah. terms of you can kick me, you can try and take me out, you can do what you want, but I only need one opportunity to score a goal, and I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that. That's, that really is it, and and it's very very true. And I now I you know now I'm a coach. I I kind of see things uh, from a wider range, right, a wider point of view, and those things are true. And one of the things that uh, you know I write down certain things quite a lot, and one of the things that always pops up is, is that, um, is the decision-making, the, the ability to, um, and it started to, it's, it really came about when people were started asking me, oh, so what were you thinking in this moment? And then I started to describe it. And then people were like, huh, like really? Like all that happened. And, 
but it's, it's normal for me to think that way, not normal for people to hear that. Um, and the process of what was happening in, in the case of like uh, a second or two seconds, you know? And, um, and, but that was kind of natural because I, I studied it. And, and I think when you study it, things become quicker and sharper. And I realized, you know, even when I went to and played in the Premier League, that things were even faster and certain players were even fast, way faster making decisions than, than I was. And I was like, wow. But I could see the decision-making process. And I think um, it is those things. I think that, that a lot of the difference is, is being able to adapt and think, right, okay, now, the, you know, for people watching, like watching a game, for instance, as an example, people watching a game and they see a goal happen and they rewind it two or three seconds or maybe five seconds and then start to speak to them and say, right, okay, this is what I'm thinking. The ball's on the left. Now I start to think. Ball's over there. Everybody's watching. Now I'm, I'm making the movement. I'm seeing the defender. Where's the defender? Where's the other defender? Now where's the space? Okay, where's the space? Okay, this is where I'm going to start to move. But I can't move there yet. I need to maybe go this direction first of all. When I make this direction, he starts to move. Then I'm going to peel and then go into this space because that's the real space that I want. The ball's happening. Maybe somebody's dribbling. I'm still looking at what's happening with the ball because I have to keep an eye on the ball. And then all of a sudden you make a movement. He sees you, makes the pass. Then you go and you, you know, maybe you go around the, the, the goalkeeper, finish. But that's sometimes the process of the two seconds or the three seconds, you know. But all of that took 10 seconds to describe. But in the moment, it happens that quick and being able to do that quickly and quickly and being able to make the right decisions as well, not just quickly, but the right decisions most of the time. I, I think you can train your intuition and uh, intuition ca- kind of comes along as well as knowledge of the moment, you know, knowledge of, you know, how this kind of plays out, you know? Yeah. And there's intuition. And I also think there's instinct as well that people use the instinct, but instinct is something you've built up over years of experience of, it may have took you three or four seconds at under 15s. It now takes me a second or two because that's the quality of player I'm playing against. I have to. So that ability to, assess what's going on around you you know that's what you're talking about you're talking about building your situational awareness you know where where am i which way am i running where's that defender going who is this defender you know am i better off Mm -hmm. getting him on his left foot you know so taking that step to my left and dragging him in and going to the right that's going to allow me to have that extra second to get a shot off later on and then you've got to know the player who's playing you're playing with who's got the ball how quickly they're going to either cross the ball or knock the ball into that area um, yeah. But once you've assessed and prioritized that information, I think you've got to make that decision and you act on it. There's no lag, is it? When I'm going, no. I'm go- when I'm going, I'm going. There's no, well, maybe I'll see what happens because it's too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, and there's loads of times and um, where it it happens and then something's a little bit off and then maybe you don't get quite the the chance. You don't get quite the pass or something happens where it it alters the outcome a little bit and those things happens a lot uh, a lot of the time as well but you especially in football in the sport that I'm in is you is you need one you might have tried 20 times in that game you might have had five times or sometimes it's the game where everything is just falls into place and you get a hat trick you score four goals and it's because those moments happen more regularly and the outcome was um in sync with everything, the, what you planned out to be. And, um, and the outcome was success, you know, real high level success because you scored two or three goals on that day. And, um, and, you know, those are the things that can come up, come of it, you know, but yeah, it's, it, it, it can happen so many times, but you know, once you can assess that and, and speed things up and practice speeding things up, um, and be be conscious of it, you know, because you have to train your subconscious a little bit to be able to naturally do it, you know, and and naturally do it is me. Sometimes you don't need to think too much about the moment. It, allow it to allow it to happen, and al- allow it to to uh, to come without you getting in the way of too much thought, you know, and and then it it it's it's that moment where you know you get asked sometimes it's like oh how did you do that. And then really you have to look back on a video or something to see how exactly it happened because in the moment you're almost automatic and, and you're, you're not really thinking too much. You're not thinking, oh, I did this and I did that. 
because it, it, it happened so quick that it was a blur and then the, the actions happened and you scored a goal and this has happened or, or something's happened because of instinct or your natural decision-making has, has made a decision for you and then, you know, it's ended up something great has happened and then you're like, I think I did this and I think I did that, but I, th I did, actually didn't think too much. It just more naturally happened and the process happened without kind of me being like, you know, step by step by step. And this is, this is exactly what happened, you know? And sometimes that takes quite a few years of, of doing it and doing it and practicing it. And it, it's, it, those situations can come and happen like that way. Yeah, and I think what you're talking about there, that's the whole point of training, isn't it? You know, you do the deliberate training, the hard yards in training to be able to then be free when you're playing the match, you know, or, or going into whatever, you know, your, your assessment criteria is in life where you just want to play instinctively. Granted, you want to, you, you know, you've got some tactics you need to try and embed from the manager or the, um, you've got your positions you need to be, you've got, you know, some maybe key things, but it, it's, it's, it's a crazy game football. You've got 22 people running around. So nothing's yeah. going to be the same. So you need to be able to think on your feet in the moment. And well, I think what you were alluding to, Ernie, was not overthinking it because that is a problem people have. They overthink things rather than just letting things happen and trusting yeah. yourself subconsciously because we talk about the conscious brain, you know, the, front, the, 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 the neocortex part of the brain, the thinking part of the brain is, is the goal setter. So that's what mm. you sit down. And this, you've talked about this quite a lot in this podcast, actually, where I've sat down, you know, not on the pitch. I'm not daydreaming on the pitch. It's when I'm at home watching movies or I'm watching reruns of Scorio on a Monday night or, you know, watching <laughs> Gazetta Football Italia, whatever it is. That's yeah. when I'm loading my conscious brain with facts and information and processes to put them into my subconscious brain because our subconscious brain is the goal getter. It's the thing that's going to drive behavior when we need it to be able to allow us to perform. And, and you, that increases your chances of hitting flow. The flow yeah. is that high subconscious behavior when everything's coming together. You know, some of your great goals, you, you can remember them vividly as if they I haven't even spoke to you about this and I can tell because I can see the way you're lighting up now. <laughs> you can remember them vividly as if they were in slow motion, even though they lasted two seconds, to the point where yeah. you'll remember colors, sounds, and even the way the ball felt on your foot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but people it's who haven't true. been there would find it so, well, no, no, it was, it was just a cross, and you flicked over, and you did a bicycle kick in the top corner. Not in my brain, it's not. It, it, I, can, I can extend that to a 10-second story and tell you every single step I did. Because yeah. the memory is that vivid, because it's from your subconscious. Yeah, 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 it's true. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Do you have an and example of that? Do you have one goal that you remember vividly more than anything else? Um, I think, I think loads. <laughs> to be honest, there's there's loads. You did score um, a few, to be fair. <laughs> um, I think you know. I, I remember. I remember scoring. Um, I remember scoring the winner against uh, against Germany. Uh, my debut for Wales, two thousand and two. Um, and um, it was, I mean, I remember that as a, because it's such a big goal for myself, but also, you know, the, just the country in itself. But like, it was my first game debut, but I remember the whole process, you know, I think we kicked off and it was a long ball. And then um, uh, I remember just assessing the situation of, right, I'm coming from the right. You know, we've just kicked off. I remember Hartson's in the middle. I, he's good in the air. If he's good in the air, uh, what angle is he facing that he can kind of see me, you know, if he does flick it on, uh, where's the defenders? And then um, if the ball goes in, in, in this kind of flight, then I make this movement inside. I remember making the movement inside because of the flight of the ball. I was looking at the flight of the ball. I saw where the ball was going to go. I saw, okay, there's a high percentage chance that he's going to win it. If he does win it, normally, generally flicks it straight on. If he's flicking it straight on, I need to be on this angle. Um, where's the defenders? And I saw the defenders, you know, I kind of a little bit further back. So I run in between them. And I thought, okay, right. If he flicks it on, it's going to end up around here. Uh, I remember taking a touch. It wasn't like a meant touch <laughs> you know the perfect touch which actually helped my finish so sometimes an accidental touch you know it helps your your finish and it, it took me on my left 
and um, and then I remember just the angle that it was on and the goalkeeper must be coming out this way and he's coming out in this direction so um, if I just get the technique right rather than the power that you know the ball's going to go this way and then it ends up you know left foot it goes in the top corner and um, you know goes back past the goalkeeper so that, is, that was one of the one of the goals that I remember you know just almost like you're playing it but like you almost zoomed out to see you're watching yourself do it <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's it's called I dissociated no it does yeah it's called this it's actually a skill it's called dissociation so you you take yourself almost like a helicopter if you're a helicopter above yourself what would yeah. it look like and it's a skill you can use as a coach for visualization so yeah. people have to see themselves doing it in the picture and then they go and become themselves and then see it through their own eyes so you've yes. probably got two pictures you've got the the hurried, fast match pace in your own eyes, which is like a blur. Yeah. And you've got yourself zoom back out, looking at yourself, and you can as if you are the camera. Yes. So yeah, in yeah. the yes. moment, but you've got all the emotions and, and feelings overlapped with it. Yes. Yeah. 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 And and that, that those are the things. And then those are the things that go into then the the things that you can't see that you know timing, you know understanding of like where the ball's gonna drop based on the angle, you know the flight of the ball. Like you can't like you know, you can't put that into stats or, you know, or things that are, I guess, measurable. It's, it's, it's things that require, you know, seeing and then understanding, you know. So there's a lot of things that then, you know, and it ends up being an action that, that's happened. But the process of that is, you know, from myself, is there's a lot of things that you can't see that have happened in that moment. And then it ends up the, the action has happened. And the result of whatever that moment has happened, goal, whatever, and then it's it ends up being a goal, and you can replay it back like that, you know. So it's uh, there's a lot of things that happen, yeah. But I, I agree, I agree. It's yeah, a lot of things happen that way, and I, I, there's a lot of times where you even you know you want certain things to happen, you've practiced certain things, and then you go out on the pitch, and then you want the practice and what's happened. Uh, in your practice to then come alive into a game and then sometimes it comes off and sometimes it doesn't but you know the the you almost premeditated it by you know you've gone through the process already and then when it does happen it's, it becomes a little bit more natural to happen in uh, in real time in a game yeah definitely right okay um we did plan to talk about your football career but to be honest with you, I think we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll skip past it because anybody can see your stats and that online you know you've got huge amount of coverage online regarding if they wanted to see what clubs you played for. Um, I'm really interested in tying up this conversation regarding you're, some, you're somebody I would describe as a conscious coach. And what I mean by that is you're very aware. You know, you're mm -hmm. very aware of your language, um, the needs of your players, your needs, you know, to, to achieve that goal. Um, it's very, very clear to see for me. So how was, how was your journey as a player setting you up, you know, for your, your coaching career to date and what your plans are for the future utilizing that um i think i think uh, like i said earlier i think the sum of all my experiences as well as my study as well as my um trying to plan out the direction that i would like to see so I would like, you know because in the end i would like to see something better i would like to see something more effective i would like to see something that achieves more so to do that is you know I, I you know from Cardiff I went to to West Brom you know got uh, bought for a few few million and you know and going into different people different um, ex people's experiences and skills and everything so really dragging a lot of those different situations together and then from there to, to Norwich to Norwich to Derby Nottingham Forest and then I went abroad uh, for a different perspective, uh, different ideas, different because I wanted to, to play, but uh, and different angle, different way of seeing things and different, complete different skills. And those things, I think, an accumulation of all those experiences and um, I think leads me into coaching, uh, leads me into where, you know, going into what I want to achieve myself, but also what I want to see, what or the things that, you know, and sometimes you can learn the most from the mistakes, but learn the most from how it's not being done, you know, and how not to do it. 
And I've had loads of those, loads of those there where I've seen situations of, okay, I, I wouldn't do it that way. I don't think that's the best way to do it. Um, I think maybe this way, that way. And those things can then direct me going forward, I think, especially, you know, dealing with players, dealing with people, dealing with um, given the best possible solutions to situations for players or improving players. I, I get so much joy from improving players because um, I would have loved some of that. And sometimes I wanted more input in, in how I could do this and how I could do this better or how I could improve. Um, and, and sometimes I even had some of that. And I, I'd take that on and be able to then give it to the next, uh, next generation, next um, you know, players that, that I coach. Um, so there's certain f- principles, certain fundamentals that I, I'll always keep based on uh, being, you know, uh, a romantic of the game, but keeping to the, keeping to the essence of the game. Things that will always, you know, in a hundred years time, they'll still be there. In a hundred years ago, they were still there, you know. Um, a, a lot of the core of the football is, is very similar. It's just how you do things, different techniques, different ways of looking at it, different ideas of how you, uh, you know, you, uh, you go into the game and how you approach the game. So different things, but um, there's certain things that I'll, I'll always take and try to make them better, try to come from them uh, and do them from a different angle completely, you know, or from a way that I've thought about that maybe is not being done. And I'm not seeing, you know, and I think, oh, actually, I think this is a really good way. This is a better way to do things. And that's what I would like to uh, achieve. That's what I would like to pass on. And I feel like, you know, there's times where, you know, even I've been in certain moments where I'm like, well, I'd like to see that. And if this was done this way and this was done this way. And sometimes I've seen certain things and I'm like, oh, right. Oh, that. I thought about that and, oh, that's nice that I got to see it, you know, and I can see that happen. And then sometimes it's not quite happened and, you know, people have not got the result. And, and I think, you know, maybe if we did try, if we did try that, that might've been, that might've been the better way and we could have achieved uh, different results. So I think a lot of those things constantly, I think um, I, I analyze and reanalyze to, to try and things, make things uh, in the or put things in a be, in the best direction for me going forward is you know especially going into coaching now and now I'm a coach I've uh, been coaching a few years and um, and there's a lot of those experiences that I've uh, led up to now but going forward that I would like to um, I would like them to come into into action you know someday. <coughs> You talked earlier about your football career in terms of planning. You had a clear focus in your mind of what I was going towards. So is it that clear with your coaching? Where do you want to be? Are you aiming for the top? Are you, you know, you, you're looking at you know, Premier League or um, you know, international level coaching. What, what's, what's in your mind's eye? Um, I think, I think it, it's not super clear. Um, that's not the most important thing. And um, I'm... I'm completely comfortable with it not being completely clear. Like I asked, I get asked uh, the question all the time and everybody asks the, the similar question. Oh, you know, where would you like to be in five years time? And where would you like to be in, in three years time? And, and I'm like, that, that, for me, that's not the question, the right question. For me, the right question is how do I want to be in three years time? Or how do I want to be in five years time? is more the question uh, because how I want to be is more important to me than where. Where you never quite know because understanding that I never knew that I would end up in Vancouver. I never knew that I would end up in Toronto, uh, in Canada, in the US and in Israel. I never knew that I would end up there. So sometimes you don't quite know exactly where, but how how I want to be is I want to be the best that I can possibly be. So the best that I can possibly be is an accumulation of all the things and experiences that I've got. And also the new ideas that I believe that, you know, that I want to achieve, see, 
um, or give where, so whether that's like, you know, in, in a role, um, with, you know, working with somebody else, that's great. That's, I, I like that, you know, um, uh, whether it's something that I achieve and go to the top and become, you know, a great manager. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I would, I would like to be, I would like to be something, um, and achieve something great, but how I do that is more important because how I do that is really what I enjoy the most is, is doing something excellently and being uh, very happy with doing something excellently, you know, and, and if that's an idea or it's a method of work or it's, um, you know, being a great coach over a few years, that's great. You know, and that's what I would like to be, you know, I would like to be, you know, um, constantly myself at a very very good level at a high level and and that's what uh, I would like to be in three years and five years time you know and that's more important to me than 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 where you know where sometimes can be determined by how you know I think that's the more the more important that's what more what I'm trying to say is is that's the the process is is way more important than me than than exact destination you know specific destination because sometimes you don't quite know where the destination will end up. Yeah, no, and I think it pulls together really nicely some of the things we've talked about where, you, you know, you, you don't always have control over the destiny, do you? But you can have control over what you do today and, and the path you're on and the journey and, and whatever opportunities arise will be driven by the fact or the things you do today as a coach. And I think that comes back to what we talked about very much at the start around that upbringing of yours. It was values-based, you know, you had a very good level of understanding of what's right and what's wrong and trying to do the right thing um and i think if you if you carry on in that vein and, and the way you're talking now as a coach and there's not many coaches that talk like you i'll be too strong you know, i spend quite a bit of time with them um i've got no doubt appreciate that mate. success whatever that means will come so um i think that's a great way of wrapping up thanks so much for your time uh, ernie rob the zambian prince um it's very much <laughs> very much appreciated you, and i know the guys would have really really enjoyed listening to this and uh We'll, we'll get their feedback, no doubt. And uh, we haven't even got into your football career per se, you know, as such. Um, we can maybe, <laughs> maybe that's that part two, I don't know. Yeah, maybe a follow-up. No, it's we'll... good. I, I'm, I'm glad, you know, it's, it's nice. It's enjoyable, um, you know, especially, you know, speaking to, with you as well. I think you do it well. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable to speak about the things I think sometimes is not really always talked about, but also it's, 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 it's there, you know, you know yeah. it's there. Um, so no, it's good. No, thanks for your time. I much appreciate it. Thanks for having me, mate. Thank you.